that is caught up in a really horrible bad day. And they're asking this question, why? So if you've got a Bible with you, if you can turn through to Psalm 73, we're going to read through all of it. It's fairly lengthy, but it's worth reading. It will come up behind me or on your screens if you're online, uh, so you will be able to follow there, but it's also helpful if you've got a Bible just to turn or scroll that way. Psalm 73. So starting at verse 1. God indeed good uh, God, God is indeed good to Israel to the pure in heart but as for me my feet almost slipped my steps nearly went astray for I envied the arrogant I saw the prosperity of the wicked they have an easy time until they die and their bodies are well fed they are not in trouble like others. They are not afflicted like most people. Therefore, pride is their necklace, and violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge out from fatness. The imaginations of their hearts run wild. They mock and they speak maliciously. They arrogantly threaten oppression. They set their mouths against heaven, and their tongues strut against the earth, across the earth. Therefore his people turn to them and drink in their overflowing words. The wicked say, how can God know? Does the Most High know everything? Look at them, the wicked. They are always at ease, and they increase their wealth. Did I purify my heart and wash my hands in innocence for nothing? For I am afflicted all day long and punished every morning. If I decided to say these things aloud, I would have betrayed your people. When I tried to understand all this, it seemed hopeless until I entered God's sanctuary. Then I understood their destiny. Indeed, you put them in slippery places. You make them fall into ruin. How suddenly they become a desolation. They come to an end, swept away by terrors. Like one walking from a dream. Lord, when arising, you will disperse their image. I despise their image. When I become embittered and my innermost being was wounded, I was stupid and didn't understand. I was an unthinking animal toward you. Yet I am always with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will, you will take me up in glory. Who do I have in heaven but you? And I desire nothing on earth but you. My flesh and my heart may fail. But God is the strength of my heart, my portion forever. Those far from you will certainly perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, God's presence is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge, so I can tell about all you do. That is Psalm 73. Let us pray, and then we'll take some time to unpack that passage. Father God, we do thank you for this psalm, and we pray that as we look at it this evening, that you would, through its words, encourage us and direct us to see your truth. So open our hearts, ears, and minds now to hear and know your truth. We ask this in your precious name. Amen. If you look up behind me, you'll see a picture of a man named William Carey. In 1773, he set sail for a life of missions in India. It was far away from his homeland. It was very different, and everyone wondered what he was doing. He had heard God's call, and he faithfully answered, and he said, Yes, Lord, here I am, send me. But from the very beginning of his ministry, he was plagued with difficulty. 
At first, his wife refused to go with him. It was only as the ship was due to set sail that she changed her mind and joined. Well, upon arrival, Carrie discovered that the person that had oversight of all of the finances that the mission organization had given them was very unwise with it, and they had nothing left. Very poor way to start this ministry. Well, with no way of getting more money and not wanting to be an additional burden to the mission that sent him, Carrie decided that he would do whatever he could to make sure that he could provide for himself and his family. He planted gardens with which to provide food. Sadly, his five-year-old son took ill and he died. Well, Carrie was unable to find anyone that would or could make a coffin, so he was forced to make his child a coffin. He was unable to find anyone that would or could help him carry the coffin or bury his little one, and so he did it. He faced extreme opposition from the Dutch East India Corporation. Later, his wife took ill, and she died. Even later on, the building which contained all the work of translating the Bible that he had been doing uh, burnt down and with it burnt away many years of hard work. But Carrie kept on working. He plodded along. He did what God had set before him to do. But why? That's a question we need to ask. Why did everything go wrong for him? Why all the suffering? Why all the pain? He was, after all, doing what God had wanted him to do. He had faithfully followed God. He was faithfully living out the call which God had placed on his life to spread the gospel. Well, if you look around you, you quickly see a world that is indeed a strange place. You may be sitting there, and you may be thinking, why, God, do people that love and know you suffer? While the wicked, while those who rebel against you, those who despise you, they seem to prosper. Well, if you ask yourself that question, you find yourself in the company of many faithful followers of God who at different times have asked the question, but why God? And Psalm 73 is one of those moments when the author of the psalm says, God, why? He asks, is it worth it? So as we begin this evening, we look at this question, the big why. Well, right at front here, we're told that the psalm is written by a man named Asaph. Asaph was a musician. He served within the temple. His job was to write songs and psalms in order to reflect where God's people were at so they would remember through singing their walk and journey with God so that all the stories, everything they needed to pass on, would be able to be recounted through song. That was his job. Well, as we look at him, we see that he seems to be troubled. Well, this psalm, as with almost all the psalms, deals with Israel, or at least Israel's stand before God, their journey with him. And here, once again, we find that Israel is not in a good place. Obviously, Asaph is caught up in all of this. And Asaph says, God, verse 1, God, Israel is pure of heart. In fact, if we read there, we see God is indeed good to Israel, to the pure of heart, implying that they're good of heart. We are your people, he says. But why then do we look around us and we see that the other nations are prospering? 
Why is it that we suffer at the hands of the wicked while they get to enjoy sundowners and on the beach while they're all sitting sprawled out on their luxury mansions on the Mediterranean? Well, Asif then describes these people to us in verse 4 to 11, and he says there that they have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. Well, that, that would be the case if you're able to look after yourself and provide food. They have no stress. At least it doesn't look like it. What is the deal with this God, says Asaph? And as he lists all, this, all of this, he then goes through the faults that they, they have. And he says that they are filled with pride. They are caught up in violence. They do not act fairly towards one another or people around them. They only think of doing evil. They oppress others. In fact, they even claim that heaven belongs to them. And their wickedness seems to win over others, as you read the psalm, who start agreeing with them. But worst of all, as we go through all of this, eventually they mock God. They say, how can God know? Does the Most High, specifically talking about Israel's God, does he have any knowledge? Massive says, despite all of this, those wicked people seem to prosper. Why God? So this psalm is asking the question, why? Why do your people suffer while life seems so good for the wicked? Well, this is a question that I'm sure many of you have asked as well. God, why? Why is that mother who loves you, who has always followed after you, only ever seen difficulty and turmoil in her life. Her husband left her and ran off with another. And he seemingly has things easy while she suffers and battles and tries hard to keep this family and children going. And God, why does Sam have it so rough at work? He is so good as far as people can see. He loves you. He serves you with all of his heart. He's a prayer warrior. He gives 110% at work. But it seems that every single step he takes, somebody's wanting to beat him down. While his colleague at work, who is a real work, is on top of each other and pushing others down all the time, well, he seems to get all the glory despite doing nothing. And now Sam is being retrenched. And his colleague is being kept on. God, why? Well, you may be sitting there wondering why your life seems so difficult. Why it seems that there's no hope of things getting better. Wondering why the corrupt get ahead. Why business contracts seem to be awarded to those who deal under the table. Well, we start off with this question of why, God? Why do bad things happen to us, your people. But importantly, as we move on from that question, we need to understand that there is a big danger within asking this question, why? And we need to face that danger. So the danger of the question, why? Well, for a number of years, I lived and worked on the slopes of one of the trademark images of South Africa, Table Mountain, which will also show up on the screen, either on your computers or behind me. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with Table Mountain. It is the standout feature. And so, sort of quarter way up the middle of the big flat mountain that you see on the screens, uh, Nikki and I had a flat that was there, and we lived and worked right there, which is called the City Bowl for Cape Town. And our number of times, whilst either at home or at work, I would hear a siren going off at the top of Table Mountain, which is just over a kilometer tall. 
And this was a warning to people who were up on the table, table mountain that it was time to remove, return back to the cable car because the wind was picking up or a storm was coming in and things were going to get dangerous. And for safety's sake, they needed to go down. Now, standing on top of that mountain is absolutely breathtaking. It's a set of mountains way out from anything else. You've got this tremendous view of the world before you. It is sure a wonderful reminder of the splendor and the greatness of God, who with the word created everything. But the reality is that that same beautiful mountain poses a huge danger to those who stand on top of it. If you lose your footing in the wrong spot, you're sure to tumble over the end and, well, I don't need to explain what will happen falling off the mountain. And this is why people are called to get off when the wind picks up. Because you're sure to lose your footing in the strong wind that blows. One step and that's all it takes to turn that place of beauty quickly into a place of horror, pain, and death. Asif knows this feeling all too well. And in verse 2, he says, I nearly lost my footing. I nearly slipped. You see, he started getting so caught up in this question of why, why things happen to those around him, that he quickly began to question whether it was worth it at all. Verse 13, we see that question, did I purify my heart and wash my hands in innocence for nothing? Was it all a complete waste of time? And this is the danger we face as we begin to grow envious of the prosperity of the wicked, envious of everything else around us, that we too begin to long after those things and eventually we run off after them. And doing that, we lose sight of God. We bring shame to his name. If you have children, you quickly see how easy it is for children to grow discontent with something that they receive. They can get the most spectacular gift on Christmas morning, and you bring them all through to church, and another child brings the most simple, plain toy that costs a few cents, but it is the whole world. And all of a sudden, their toy, they lose a heart for it, they're not excited for it, and they, when you have to pull them home, they upset because that is the toy that they want. They don't want this one. All of a sudden, this is tossed aside. They grow envious of that thing, and they lose the joy of what they have before them. Well, this is the danger that we face if we keep on focusing on the good things that happen to wicked people. It eventually leaves us to wonder whether it's worth it at all. leads us to ask, well, God, should I follow you? Should I love you? Are you actually there? It causes us to doubt. There's a fable of an eagle that was envious of another eagle who could fly way higher than he could. And one day, a sportsman was standing on the ground, and he looked up and he said, I wish I could bring down that eagle that's flying way up there. But he knew his arrows would never be able to reach. And the man said that if he had just one or two more feathers, he'd be able to shoot far enough. And so quickly, the jealous eagle pulled out one or two of his own feathers and gave it to uh, the, this hunter. Well, the hunter put those feathers into his bow and uh, shot an uh, arrow and shot it but it was just not able to get the distance and height that it needed. So the jealous eagle pulled out another feather. Again, the hunter couldn't quite reach and said he needed another. 
And so the eagle pulled out another and another until he had lost so many feathers that he himself could not fly. And the archer took advantage of the situation, turned around and killed the helpless bird. You see, getting caught up in the prosperity of others and the good things that happen to seemingly bad people around us leads us down a similar path. Eventually it leaves you so far removed from your primary objective, namely to be someone that brings glory to God, that Satan in turn stands there watching you, slowly pulling your feathers out. And then when there's nothing left, he pounces leaving you broken and bruised, failing to live in the hope to which God has called you as one of his children. Well, this is a situation that Asaph found himself in. He was close to losing his footing. He was close to living a life of total hopelessness despite being one who actually had great hope. All because he fell for Satan's snare and grew envious of his wicked neighbor's prosperity. But as we read through the psalm, we see that while he is falling, he seems to be lifted. He remembers what it means to truly belong to God. And there we come to see the picture of true prosperity. In verse 17 of our psalm, we see that he enters God's temple. And when he comes into that place of worship, that place where he can be with God, and as he approaches God, he realized where his true prosperity lay. He also realized what the true final destination was for those nations around and was anything but glamorous because they would be judged, they would be destroyed, they would be swept away. That is what they truly had to look forward to. However, Asaph, He knew that despite his imperfections, despite his failures, because he was God's, he had true prosperity. Verse 23 to 26 of our psalm, we we get this whole idea flowing for us. He was always with God. God always held him. God was his counsel, even if his earthly body was failing. He was with God, and God would reside with him forever. Well, Asaph's spirits is lifted as he remembers what belonging to God means. That outside of God's will, people will perish. But for Asaph, well, in God, he has eternal refuge. And so he will speak of the goodness of God as long as he can. The Asif comes to a point of realizing where true prosperity lay. It was not in the material world that he was starting to crave after and want as he looked around him. It was not where money and possessions and uh, the personal pursuit of happiness just seemed to bring all sorts of fulfillment, which in the end led to nothing. For him, true prosperity comes from knowing that he was safely tucked under the wings of the Almighty God, who will forever provide and care for him. Well, when William Carey was asked why he kept on doing what he was doing, despite the opposition that he faced, despite all the hardship and those things that just constantly went wrong, he said, It is because I know who I am in Christ. It is because I know who I am in Christ. You see, knowing who he was in Christ is what drove him forward. 
what kept him going even when all of these why questions came around because he knew he had purpose and meaning in Christ. In 2 Corinthians 4, verse 16 to 17, we, we get a reminder that we must not lose heart. What does it say? We must not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away. Inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 to 17. See, no matter how, imper- how perfect life seems to be for the wicked, they remain poor. They remain in a worse of state than you. That is if you are in Christ Jesus. You have hope then, as one that belongs to Christ. Hope that transcends and endures for all eternity. For those outside of God's will, They have the certainty of eternal torment and suffering. So at the end of the psalm we're left thinking, well, who do you think truly has prosperity? Who is prosperous here? And why is this an important psalm? We live in a world that is increasingly materialistic. The more you have, well, the more the world thinks you are a success. If you don't have the latest and the best, well, then there's something wrong with you. You have a problem. You're not doing something right. You need to keep up in order to be noticed. If you want to be well known, well, then you need to be with it and you need to have status that only the world can offer. Well, the warning that we see in this psalm from Asaph. Here in the year 2021 is that things are not much different for us today as they were 3,000 odd years ago BC. The world then said that to be noticed, to be something, you needed to be the best. You needed to go with what the world said, not stand out like God's people were meant to have. If you did not, well then you were doing something wrong. Well, don't get caught up in the lie, thinking that it's a waste of time obeying God. Don't live life so envious of what others have that you fail to live in the joy of knowing that in Christ you have true prosperity. That in Christ you have a God who holds your hand and a God who will take you into eternal glory with him forever. Don't allow yourself to get too caught up in envy that you stumble and fall and lose your footing and that you end up living a life that makes your witness for God ineffective. William Carey became instrumental in bringing hope to the gospel and gospel to his India. Because of his labor and because of the work in, of the Holy Spirit in and through his life, it's estimated that 100 million people today have been saved. It's a phenomenal number. All of this because he understood where his true reward lay because he understood what true prosperity was. Had he given in and said, you know what? It's not worth it. Who knows, India may be in a very different place today. But he remained focused on God. He lived in joy, knowing where his eternal hope lay. And in doing that, like Asaph, Right at the end of our psalm, he could tell of all God's wonderful deeds with great credibility because he stood firm. Or will you tell of God's wonderful deeds? It's only possible if you remain focused on him, not allowing your footing to be lost. The only way that things truly work out for good, 
the only way you will be truly prosperous is if you look to God. Romans two verse Romans eight verse twenty eight all things work for the good of those who love him. True good, true prosperity is only brought about by God and only possible if you have faith in him, if you submit your life to him. True prosperity, according to the world, is one that will give you momentary pleasure and will quickly fade away because it's nothing more than a facade when it's put into the framework, that great, grand, eternal scaffolding of God's great design. Well, when next you find yourself asking the big question, why? And you ask yourself, why am I battling? Why is this thing happening? When you find yourself slipping to a point of saying, well, is it all worth it? Would you remember what the world offers you? And remember that the world can offer you nothing beyond death. And remember that in Christ you have eternal hope. Hope of a glorious eternity with God. And this deserves praise. Like Asaph says at the end, it deserves your testimony of God's goodness in your life despite the obstacles that you may face. Let us pray. But as for me, God's presence is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge, so I can tell about all you do. Lord, may those words be true of us, Lord God, we admit that so often we do look around us with great envy at what's going on. We look around us wondering, yes, wondering why your people, people who love and serve you, people who are seemingly good, at least from the things they do, why they battle, yet those who reject you don't, and they have it good. But Lord God, help us not to be so focused on the wrong part of that question. Help us to be focusing on the true reality that is there, that as yours we have a hope that lasts forever. Lord God, would you help us in the midst of turmoil, in the midst of trial and difficulty, to stand firm, as Asaph does, and to be able to proclaim your goodness because of the certainty that we have that lasts for all eternity as ones belonging to you. Lord God, I do pray for anyone sitting here watching online who may be in a difficult, dark place right now because life is difficult, because they do feel distant, because they wonder where you are. Would you just give them a new vision, Lord? Help them to see you. Help them to grab hold of you and to see the lens through which Asaph was able to see that eternal glory that lay before him. Help them to know as one's belonging to you, that is the same glory that belongs to them. And would that bring them refreshed hope, refreshed joy, and the energy to carry on. So Lord God, help us to continue thinking through this psalm in the week that lies ahead. Would you embed its truths in our hearts and help us to live as ones that bring you glory. We ask